Hello Year 10. The next pair of poems that we're going to look at are The Emma Grey by Carol Rumans and Poppies by Jane Weir. Now we've seen these assessment objectives plenty of times before, so very quickly to reiterate, assessment objective one is your ability to understand what the poems are about and to be able to use quotations or textual references. Assessment objective two is your ability to analyse the language, form, structure and sound devices with poetry used within the poems for effect. And then finally, assessment objective three is to be able to make those links between the poems, the poets and the historical context of their poems or the social context. So what influenced the poets and what made them want to write these poems. Okay, so the big question that we're going to focus on for Poppies and the Emigre are how are the after effects of war and identity presented in the Emigre and Poppies? So by looking at this question, we're going to revise both of the poems and look at key quotations. We're going to think about the poems in comparison to one another and we're going to analyse the range of methods, so language, imagery, structure, sound, etc. Okay, so as mentioned in the previous few PowerPoints, you can often get quite a lot of analysis out of the title. So with the emigre, it suggests that the poem is going to focus on the experience of leaving one's home country, so being an emigrant and we see that the girl in the poem has left due to war and tyranny. The second thing that we can say about the title is that the child in the poem and the country are anonymous, although the French word in the title implies that the emigrant has moved to England from a French-speaking war-torn country. And then finally, the noun that's used in the title is a feminine noun, so we know that the subject of the poem, the young girl, is female. Um, if we wanted to say a little bit more, it's quite important that this poem focuses on emigration rather than immigration. So Rumens clearly wants to focus on the experience of leaving your homeland rather than the experience of moving to a new country. So lots of the themes within the poem are actually about homesickness, nostalgia, so all those memories that she has of home, and the feelings of being excluded from her home country and being displaced from where she belongs. It's quite important to note that the poem is not autobiographical, so Rumens has clearly had to base this poem on second-hand accounts of emigration and displacement. Therefore, we can actually look at the anonymity of the emigrant as being deliberate. So perhaps Rumens is suggesting that the experience of the average emigrant is similar. It's generic. So most emigrants will feel homesickness. Despite what's going on in their own home countries, they miss home. So the emigrant in the poem becomes the everyman figure. She represents emigration as a concept for anyone that's ever experienced it. Also, we can say that the anonymity of the emigre in the poem could be symbolic of the fact that emigrants lose their identity during that process of emigration. They become a number on a roll. Uh, they lose everything that identifies them as belonging to their homeland. So when we look at some of the words used in Rumen's poem, um, we can see that there seems to be a theme in several of these poems regarding darkness and light. So Rumen's uses words such as sunlight, white, glow, dark and shadow. So we can see that that semantic field of light and dark is used to juxtapose the positive feelings and memories that the emigrant has about her homeland before she left against the negative feeling she has about it now since the dictators or the tyrants she calls them took over. So we can also see light and darkness here as metaphors for good and evil. If you wanted to focus more on some of these words 
you could look at how the white streets that she refers to and the glow are symbolic of her country's purity and the clarity of her memory of it. So the memory that she has of home is untainted, it's unspoiled by anything that she might have read in the newspapers since. She tells us that she hears in the newspapers the worst news but still she chooses to remember it as a place of innocent and happy childhood memories, which is what children do. They remember the positive things and they censor out the, the negative things often. So her memories are unspoiled by war and conflict. When she talks about glow, it could imply to her that her homeland has this metaphorical halo around it suggesting that that memory is sacred and holy. Again, if you wanted to look more at the images of darkness and the words dark and shadow, we could link that to how the dictators who've taken over perceive the girl and other emigrants now that she's left. It's almost as if she's perceived as a traitor who's abandoned her home. And that's because obviously darkness has connotations of negativity. However, ironically, shadow and darkness can only exist with the presence of light. So by escaping to another country and seeking asylum or refuge, she and other emigrants have taken that light, that positivity with them. So they can actually retain that positive memory of their country and hopefully one day they'll be able to go back and restore the country as it once was. The fact that these emigrants carry the legacy of their country as it once was and they remember it with absolute clarity, it's sunlight clear, means that they have the power in the future to dethrone the lie that has become their country's identity and hopefully restore it at some point to its former glory. Moving on to the imagery then in the poem, one of the best quotations to look at is the simile, that child's vocabulary I carried here like a hollow doll. So what we can see is that Rumens is using simile to suggest that the girl was so young when she emigrated that she was like an empty vessel, something hollow, that was ready to be filled with knowledge and language. Now it's interesting that children are often far easier to brainwash and indoctrinate with propaganda because they haven't yet got their own independent views. So the people who are looking after them or guiding them can filter and censor the information that they want these children to learn. So that means that children are exposed only to what their manipulators choose. Now, if we want to analyse the effect of describing the girl as a doll, it implies that she's a plaything of those around her. She's at the whim of those who take ownership of her, so they can do as they choose with her. Metaphorically, they can control her thoughts and actions. They can even put words into her mouth, in the same way that children do with dolls by making them talk and making them move. So this might be one reason why her family emigrated when she was so young. Perhaps they wanted to prevent her falling into the wrong hands, where she could be manipulated and shaped to be whatever those tyrants wanted her to be. For assessment objective three, it's quite important to note that throughout history, young people have been targeted the most for indoctrination by propaganda. So dictators like Hitler would garner support from young people, because they're the next generation, by setting up these youth groups, a bit like the Scouts, the Boy Scouts. Um, there was something called the Hitler Jugend, the Hitler Youth. And they'd do all of the fun activities that the Scouts would do, but they would also do things that were tinged with nationalism. So things that were designed to make them um, anti-Semitic, so against the Jews, etc. So they'd learn how to march, they'd learn war songs, they'd recite slogans that were part of the propaganda. So it was all a subtle way of training them to become the soldiers of the future, 
without the children realising that it was going on, because it's a good way to brainwash young, impressionable minds, make them think they're having fun, but actually you're politicising them, you're making them political. Now we're going to look at the next quotation for a structural point to start with, but there's lots more to say about it as well. So in the quotation, I am branded by an impression of sunlight, we can see that Rumens uses an end stop line, and this is actually at the end of each stanza. So each stanza ends with the word sunlight followed by a full stop. Now, this suggests that despite any news of war and tanks that the girl receives through the newspapers, her positive memory of her homeland and city is fixed. Nothing can erase that memory. If you actually look more closely at the verb branded, it suggests that that positive memory that she has of home is seared into the girl's memory, leaving a very permanent impression or mark. It's indelible. It can't be erased. It can't be wiped away. That might remind you of how in Checking Out My History, John Agard said, I carving out my identity, where carving is a mark that can't easily be wiped away. So branded has a similar effect here. Now the noun, noun sunlight reinforces this positive view that she has of her country because light often has connotations of optimism and hope. However, on the flip side of that, we can say that perhaps it might imply that she's blinded by that positive view of home and she refuses to acknowledge and see what her country has become. So it could actually be that the girl is deluding herself, she's lying to herself, she's in denial and she's desperate to cling on to a memory that no longer exists. Now that idea of clinging on to a memory is supported even further by the metaphor bright filled paperweight which implies that the girl's memory is like an anchor that she holds on to. It keeps her rooted in her na national identity. So that memory can't be budged because the purpose of a paperweight is to hold something down. If you also think of a paperweight as being a little bit like a snow globe, where you've got a glass ball with a, a scene captured inside, it implies that that positive memory is preserved inside her head. It's protected from any external influences telling her otherwise. Now, if you think about the scenes inside those snow globes, they're often fairy tale castles. They're, they're quite idealized, perfect images. So perhaps that's suggesting that her memory of home is actually fictional. It's idealized and it's fairy tale like. So ultimately it's unrealistic. And that's further supported by the opening line of the poem, There Once Was a Country, which actually sounds like the opening of a fairy tale. Okay, so if we move on to looking at the tone of Rumen's poem, uh, we'd use the quotation, it may be sick with tyrants. So firstly, we can see that Rumen's is using personification of the homeland. And we can see that the girl is lamenting the situation in which her country finds itself. Now, what that means is that the girl feels distressed by her country's situation and she sympathises with it, wishing that she could help. So she wants to metaphorically help cure the disease of tyranny that infects it and spreads like an epidemic really quickly. By personifying the country, um, we can see then that her country needs healing, it needs help. And that idea is extended throughout the poem when she says, I comb its hair and love its shining eyes, and then her city takes her dancing. So in the first instance, we see when she combs its hair that she regards her homeland as a place that needs nurturing back to health. It needs caring for in order to heal. It conjures up an image there of a mother caring for a child. So it's almost as if her country is dependent on people like her to restore it to what it once was. In the second example, where her city takes her dancing, 
we can see that the girl and her city are rebelling against some of the strict controls imposed upon her homeland. Things like dancing would often be banned and outlawed because they were a clear expre expression of individuality, of freedom and happiness and celebration. So by dancing with her city, she's laughing in the face of the strict controls that have most likely been introduced in her homeland. As we know, she says that things have been banned by the state. So just to expand on that with assessment objective three, as referred to a few seconds ago, in many dictatorships, the ruling powers actually prohibit or censor any form of self-expression, including things like literature, music, art. And that's because they fear any kind of communication that might promote views or ideas that are opposite to their own propaganda. Now, a good example of that is in Nazi Germany, there was an evening called Pogrom, which is where the government actually encouraged people, German people, to go out and plunder Jewish bookshops and basically burn all the books and artwork by Jewish writers and artists. So by the girl in the poem dancing with her city, metaphorically, it's suggesting that dancing might be outlawed in her homeland because it might challenge the strict discipline of the new government. Okay, so to summarise some of the key after effects of war and the identity points being made by Rumans, we could say that she's suggesting that national identity is something which cannot be taken away from somebody in any circumstances. She might be suggesting that most people are generally very proud of their national identity, despite what's going on in their homeland, and they think of home fondly. Thirdly, she might be implying that war can cause physical displacement and exile, so people have to physically leave their homes, but it can't erase or control their memories of home. Governments will never be able to control the thoughts of people. And then finally, it could suggest this poem that memories can be idealised and they can actually hold you back and prevent you moving on and accepting the truth. So to sum up, some of the themes that Rumen seems to be addressing would be war and conflict, dictatorship and tyranny, national pride and patriotism and how that can be a good thing but also possibly hold you back memories and nostalgia and exile and exclusion where exile is when you are compelled to leave your home you are forced to do it okay so that for those pupils aiming for a grade seven or above a comment that might extend you and allow you to access those those grades would be by pointing out that rumens makes reference to almost all of the senses in this poem so we've got sight with sunlight clear, we've got sound by I am told, we've got taste with I can't get it off my tongue, it tastes of sunlight, we've got touch, I comb its hair. So that suggests that the girl's memories, as often our memories are, are multi-sensory. So when she remembers home, she remembers the taste of things, the smell of things, the sound of things. And that makes her memories all the more vivid and resonant, all the more powerful and harder to budge. Now it's that that the dictators and tyrants have to conquer if they want to succeed in completely controlling people. But controlling people's minds and their memories is much more challenging than controlling them physically. So you can stop them going to certain places, but you can't control what they're thinking deep down inside. So moving on to Poppies by Jane Weir, if we look at the title of this poem, it tells us immediately that one of the poem's key themes is the commemoration of soldiers who've died during the war. We also know that the poem uses the symbol of the poppy as representative of loss and sacrifice. 
And finally, it's important to acknowledge that the voice of this poem is a bereaved mother whose son has died at war. So we can see that war and conflict affects other people, not just the soldiers who fight in it. So this poem's written from the perspective of the bereaved mother who looks back nostalgically via these flashbacks of pivotal episodes in her son's life at his life before he went to war as a young soldier. Now, notably, one of those episodes or pivotal moments is the day of her, her son's departure. So the poem deals with the overwhelming desire that the mother had and still has to protect her little boy even though she knows it's impossible when he leaves for the war and ultimately dies. So one of the things that causes her most pain is the fact that she was unable to protect him when he was suffering on that battlefield. So it's a poem of grief, loss, nostalgia about all those happy memories of him as a boy and futility, so the needless loss of his life. For assessment objective three, we need to be aware that poppies have been the symbol of war sacrifice since World War I, when apparently they were the first flowers to sprout up out of the soil where many soldiers had fallen and died in Belgium. They've also been a symbol of death for a long time because of their blood red colour and they're also a symbol of peace and sleep, so the idea of resting in peace, because of their opiate sedative qualities. Now, the fact that poppies were rumoured to have sprung from the fields where World War I soldiers had fallen suggests that the blood-soaked soil nourished new life, implying perhaps that the poppy is a symbol not only of remembrance of those we've lost, but also hope for the future and a fresh start. So that's why poppies and wreaths of poppies are laid on Armistice Sunday which is a day that's referenced in the poem. Moving on to the words that Jane Weir uses, we can see blockade, bandaged and reinforcements. So Weir uses a semantic field of language linked to the war. It's quite military language. And that obviously fits with the poem's subject matter, but it also suggests that the mother is constantly preoccupied with the cause of her son's death. So everything about her existence is tinged with these memories of war and that's reflected in her use of language. So her life has changed forever. Now the verb bandaged is used to describe the mother removing cat hairs from her son's blazer. Now that could be her son's school blazer, showing that that was a pivotal memory when he went to secondary school or it could be the blazer that was part of his military uniform. And she removes those cat hairs with sellotape. Now the verb bandaged is used to imply that the mother wishes, retrospectively, that she'd been present to tend to her dying son's wounds on the battlefield. And that's her main regret, because it's a mother's instinct to ease her child's pain. She remembers removing the hairs as a pivotal moment because it sums up the care and nurture and tenderness that a mother shows to her child. And that image that sticks in her head and that Weir puts into our heads is incredibly poignant and moving. However, all those memories have been tainted and spoiled by how her son died. So everything that she tries to remember as a positive is always tinged and coloured with that negativity, that negative image of war. So if we wanted to stretch it even further, we could look at the noun reinforcements and say that that's used as a metaphor to describe scarves and gloves, which suggests that as a mother of a young boy, she would make sure he was fully equipped to withstand the cold. Now reinforcements in a military sense are extra men or more ammunition. Whereas the mother gave him extra reinforcements as a boy by giving him extra layers of warm clothes to protect him. So again, you can see that her instinct is to protect her son, which she was unable to do when he was on the battlefield. 
and we can see that that brutal military language of reinforcements is juxtaposed against the tender nurturing actions of the boy's mother. So she's painfully aware of her absence in his dying hours and all she can take some comfort from is that she did try and protect him as a boy. If we look at the imagery used by Weir then, in Leaned Against It Like a Wishbone, we can see that the simile suggests that the mother almost collapses against the church wall for support when she visits the war memorial. So her grief is so intense that it weakens her significantly and physically. And when she leans, the shape of her body against the wall resembles a wishbone. Now, ironically, you need two people to snap a wishbone and her son's absent, so she has no one to snap that metaphorical wishbone with. It may have actually been an activity that she and her son did when he was a child, but now he's gone, she can no longer carry it out, meaning that she can no longer make her wish. Her wish obviously would be that her son could return and be resurrected, which she knows is impossible. So it's quite a tragic image. She has other memories um, of physical activities with her son, such as she mentions when she used to graze her nose across the tip of his nose to play at being Eskimos like they did when he was little. So these moments, which seem apparently quite trivial, actually hold a deeper significance to the mother now that she's lost her son because they were genuine moments of being tactile and physically close. Now, as the mother leans against the church wall, she listened, hoping to hear his playground voice catching on the wind. Now, the verb listened is quite important to analyse because it's subtly different to heard, because listened implies that you're expecting to hear something rather than it being by chance rather than it being incidental. Now that fact that she is deliberately trying to hear something is reinforced by the verb hoping, which sums up the mother's futile optimism that one day her son might return in one form or another. Now that makes the poem particularly tragic, the fact that the mother still has this vain hope that one day she'll be reunited with her son who's deceased. For structure then we're going to look at the quotation you were away intoxicated after you'd gone. Now the full stop after intoxicated is an example of we're using Volta and that Volta indicates the shift the time shift from before her son's departure to after so it's a significant turning point in the poem. So it was a pivotal moment in the mother's life when everything changed for her and she felt she lost her identity as a mother. Now it's deliberately ambiguous as to whether the moment she's referring to is when her son left for the war, which seems to be the obvious moment, or when he became an adolescent, so a teenager, no longer interested in spending time with his mother. And either experience would hurt a mother quite significantly. Now, if you look at this line again, it seems to make reference to a syndrome called empty nest syndrome, which is a phenomenon where mothers in particular feel bereaved almost when their teenage children leave home after having cared for them for so many years. So that loss can be quite intense. So therefore, the mother's experienced that trauma of him leaving twice over. Once, metaphorically, when he grew up into a young man and didn't involve himself as much with her. And secondly, literally, when he left for the army. So the verb intoxicated, which is also metaphorical, implies that the excitement of the world and its temptations and freedoms and opportunities overwhelms the young man so much that it almost makes him drunk on life and giddy with anticipation whereas all his mother feels is sadness and all she wants to do is protect him from the world again if you wanted to stretch it even further 
the excitement that the young man feels at stepping out into the big wide world is reinforced by the simile overflowing like a treasure chest implying by reference to treasure that the world is full of richness and variety that he wants to explore. So the concept of empty nest syndrome is explored further by reference to the fact that the mother released a songbird from its cage, where this metaphor implies that eventually all mothers need to set their children free and let them spread their metaphorical wings and fly and find freedom no matter how painful that might be for them. If we want to consider the tone of the poem then, a good quotation to look at is Steeled the softening of my face, which is also a metaphor and suggests that the emotion of her son leaving home is about to overwhelm the mother, so she quickly has to compose herself and harden herself so that he doesn't see any weakness in her. The verb steeled therefore, is metaphorical, but it also fits into that semantic field of military imagery, and it suggests that the mother's trying to be like an emotionless machine when she says goodbye. Now, that image of attempting to harden both her facial expression and her heart to his departure is an example of a mother's selflessness. She doesn't want her son to see her upset, when he's so excited about his future. Now after that, once he's gone, she tells us that she's slowly melting, which again is a metaphor implying that despite her best efforts to compose herself in front of him, her emotions are thawing and they're about to overwhelm her and flood her in tears. So it's everything she can do to contain those emotions until her son has left. Whilst he's there, she's brave. Now that adjective is usually associated with physical deeds, often on the battlefield. But here we're seeing the emotional bravery of the mother saying goodbye to her son. So some of the key points that Weir seems to be making about the after effects of war and identity would be that bereavement and grief are inevitable consequences of war for those people linked to soldiers fighting, not just the soldiers themselves. We also see that the boy's mother is in some denial of her new identity as a recently bereaved mother. We also see quite clearly that war and conflict can alter one's life irrevocably, so irreversibly, she can't change it. And it's not, again, just the soldiers lives that it can change it's the people left behind and linked to those soldiers and finally a mother can feel futile and useless when she's not fulfilling her role as nurturer and caregiver so similarly to some of the themes explored in the emigre we can see that Weir seems to be addressing the following themes war and conflict memories and nostalgia, which we've seen in both poems, grief, bereavement and loss, which again we do see in the emigre as well, because she's lost her identity, lost her homeland. Obviously there's a theme of identity, so the identity that she feels she's lost as a mother in poppies. And finally the theme of guilt. So I've just put there, can you explain how this theme is relevant? Well, the mother has this overwhelming sense of guilt that she wasn't there in her son's final hours. And even though she wouldn't have been able to do anything, just giving him that emotional support, she really regrets not being there to do that. So obviously it's not her fault, but she feels that quite intensely. If we want to stretch towards a grade seven or above then, we know that we need to talk effectively about structure. So this poem is actually an irregular combination of enjambment, caesuras and end stop lines. Now that has the effect of imitating the mother's attempts to contain and control her emotions. So when enjambment is used, for example in I wanted to graze my nose across the tip of your nose, player Eskimos, it suggests that her memories are running away with her 
and her emotions are getting the better of her. However, the caesuras and end stop lines often indicate where she checks herself and she stops herself. She takes a deep breath and she tries to reel that emotion back under control. For example, in Steeled the Softening of My Face, which is followed by that full stop. So I've written a sample paragraph in response to the question, how do poets present identity in the emigre and one other poem of your choice? So this is how you might start a response. So both Carol Rumans and Jane Weir choose to focus on the concept of identity in their poems, the emigre and poppies, and how this identity can be confirmed or altered by war. In both poems, identity is presented as something that our mental health and sense of well-being is rooted in. In the emigre, for example, Rumans presents an emigrant girl whose memory of her homeland, despite now being war-torn, is sunlight clear, a metaphor implying that her memories of home are wholly positive, as light has connotations of goodness and optimism, and remembered with absolute clarity. Moreover, the fact that there is an end stop after this statement reinforces that this positive memory is fixed in her head. This strong pride in national identity is something that characterises the attitudes of many emigrants, irrespective of the reasons for their exile. Similarly, in Poppies, Weir presents the positive memories a bereaved mother has of her recently deceased son. In the metaphor, sellotape bandaged around my hand, the mother fondly remembers a time when her son was young and she fussed over him, removing hairs from his blazer, nurturing him as mothers do. However, the verb bandaged is significant as it has connotations of war and injury, implying the mother feels almost guilty that she wasn't there to tend to his wounds when he was injured on the battlefield. This failure, as she sees it, to fulfil her role as nurturer, affects her sense of identity as a mother. Since her son's death, she has almost been in denial that she is now a bereaved mother, choosing instead to listen for his voice in the wind and hoping vainly that one day he might return. So you can see there again that we've got our assessment objective one, which is our quotations, which are well selected. We've got, well, we've shown understanding of the poems and how in one, the girl feels quite a strong national identity despite leaving home and whereas in the other the mother feels she's lost her identity as a mother. So we've got our AO1, we've got our AO2 because we've spoken about imagery, metaphors etc. We also spoke about some structural features, end stop lines. So we're covering the assessment objectives. If you wanted to develop that further you may add some assessment objective three, talking a little bit about the significance of poppies, the title, so you could develop it further in that way. So we've been through these several times before, but just to sum up, don't worry if you can't write comparatively. You are allowed to write all about one poem and then all about the second poem, making just a brief link with a connective between the two. Remember also that you don't have to write an equal amount on each poem, so if you feel more confident with one, that's absolutely fine, say a bit more about that. Do remember, however, to try and address all the assessment objectives, particularly assessment objective two, the analysis of the, the poetic methods. With assessment objective three, remember that it's not weighted as heavily as the other assessment objectives. So if you are making points about context, make sure they are explicitly linked to what you're saying about the poem and the quotations and keep the comments brief. 